Welcome back to another episode of Word Safari. This is the third episode in a three-part series on elemental etymology, where we look at the etymologies of all of the elements on the periodic table. We're going to look at the final 45 elements here on the periodic table in this episode, which comprises elements 74 through 118. We've already looked at the first 73 in the last two episodes. Uh, as far as these elements, you may have heard of some of them. You probably will have heard of at least a few of them, but many of them are obscure elements. And honestly, several of the ones toward the end are so recently named that uh, they weren't in the textbooks when I was in school. And I'm not even that old because, of course, they keep discovering elements. They keep synthesizing them. And eventually, we'll have to uh, update this episode with elements 119 and 120 and so on whenever they are officially discovered. Uh, there's a mix of etymological sources in these final 45 elements of the periodic table, which is not abnormal. As we've seen, there's a mix of sources going all the way back to the first episode when we looked at the first 25 elements. However, that mix is going to be changing as we progress through the periodic table. Seven of these are named for some kind of property that they have, uh, a property of the element. Only one is named for a well-known source or compound. Uh, in the previous two episodes, these two sources were by far the most common. And as you can see, they've really gone down, downhill here in these final 45 elements. Um, there's a reason for this, and that is that many of these final 45 elements uh, are, were synthesized. Uh, in other words, they don't occur naturally in nature. They don't occur in compounds that were well known before they were synthesized from those compounds. And so it kind of makes sense that only one of these would even be named for a source compound. And as it turns out, it's element 74, the very first one, uh, at least in the numerical sequence here of the 45 that we're going to be talking about, that was actually named for a source compound. So once you get past element 74, you don't really have this happening anymore. So what's replacing this in the etymology? In other words, if these final elements are not being named for their property as much, and they're not being named for a well-known source or compound as much, what are they being named for? Well, 13 of them are named for a place or region of origin, because when these elements have been recently discovered or synthesized, uh, oftentimes the discoverers have named them for where they're from or where this discovery happened. So that kind of makes sense. Six of them have been named for mythological figures, and we have seen that some earlier elements all also were named for mythological figures. Uh, three of them were named for similarities to other elements, but then the new entry to our list here that's going to take up a lot of the elements we're going to be looking at is that 14 of these elements were actually named for individuals because individuals were discovering them, but it was uh, basically unheard of for you to name an element after yourself if you discovered it. So oftentimes you would name it after somebody famous. And so most of the elements on the periodic table that are named for individuals, really all of them actually, were named for somebody who was uh, who was famous and either dead or very, very old in a couple of rare cases. Finally, only one etymology that we're going to look at in this list uh, is an etymology that was lost to history. So let's dive in. First, we're going to examine those seven elements that are named for some kind of property that they have. And one very famous element that falls in this list is the element gold, which I'm sure is one of the ones that you have all heard of. Gold goes all the way back to Old English. This word was an Old English word that was spelled the same way. It was pronounced slightly differently, maybe like gold uh, without uh, with a slightly different O sound. But regardless, it's basically the same word. Hasn't changed much at all in 1500 years. And this word in turn goes back through Proto-Germanic all the way to Indo-European, and it comes from a well-known Indo-European root, gel, which meant something like shiny, but it could also mean yellow. Proto-Indo-European -Indo color terms are rather complicated, and so this is a word that can mean shiny or yellow, depending on how you used it. So this is, a, this is an element that was named thousands of years ago for one of its properties, and obviously one of the most salient properties of the element gold is that it's yellow and it's shiny, so that's really actually just all this word means. It's the shiny yellow metal. By the way, our word yellow in English also comes from the Indo-European root gel. So yellow and gold are etymologically connected. Pretty cool. Where does the symbol AU come from? It actually comes from the Latin word for gold, which was aurum. Uh, and this word would evolve into the Romance languages in a number of recognizable ways. So for instance, in French today, this is or, just O-R. Uh, in Spanish, it's oro. So if you know uh, Spanish, you know that oro means gold. And oro just comes from the Latin aurum, the word didn't change that much over the past thousand years. 
Uh, let's talk about other elements, the other six elements that were named for some kind of property that they have. Osmium, number 76, was actually named for the Greek word osme, which means smell, because apparently the element had a very strong smell as it was being synthesized. Thallium was named for another Greek word, thallos, which in Greek means green shoot or twig or something like that. Again, this is a color that is associated with the element, and that's how it got its name. Bismuth, which is element 83, uh, comes from the German language, Wismut, which is a dialectal way in German of saying white mass. It's an element that has kind of a white look, and of course it's a mass of something, right? Um, and so we're pretty sure that that is where the name Bismuth ultimately comes from, although that etymology is a little bit in doubt. That is our best guess, and it's a pretty decent guess. Astatine actually was just coined from the Greek uh, adjective astatone, which can be split up into two parts, a, which means not, and statone, which means stable. We have talked about the sta root on this channel not too long ago. The sta root is an Indo-European root that means to stand or to be stable, so words like stand and stable come from this, uh, and so you can see the sta root at work here in ancient Greek. So if you are astatone, you are unstable. Of course, this this is one of the radioactive elements, so it is a very unstable element, and that is how it got its name. Two other radioactive elements that were discovered fairly early on uh, in the history of radioactive elements being discovered are radium and actinium, and these both have the same etymology, ultimately, but from two different languages, Latin and Greek. Radium gets its name from the Latin word for a ray, which was radius, and actinium gets its name for the ancient Greek word for ray, which was octus, and then if you wanted to say plural, it'd have an N in there, like octanase or something like that, which is where the N comes from in actinium. So uh, again, both of these are radioactive elements, uh, and so they shoot forth rays of energy, and that is where the names of these two elements come from. If you're wondering, radio and radioactive both also come from the Latin word radius, ray, so it kind of makes sense where that term comes from. Uh, let's talk about the one element that gets its name from uh, some kind of source or compound that was known well before the element. That element is number 74, which is tungsten. Uh, it comes from the Swedish tungsten, and you can, uh, you can actually split that up into two parts, tung and sten. Sten means stone. It's clearly cognate with our word, English, uh, our word in English, which is, of course, stone. Sten and stone, same word, ultimately. Um, so there was a compound that was called tungsten or tungsten, which meant a heavy stone. It was that was obviously uh, a descriptor of it. And then the element was ultimately derived from that compound and given the same name as the compound. Uh, another source compound of tungsten was wolframite. Uh, wolfram comes from two words that mean something like wolf's spittle or something like that. It's a strange term, um, and there's a whole reason that you can go back and look if you're curious about where the term for this compound comes from. As it turns out, in some languages, this element got the name wolfram instead of tungsten because those were two different compounds that you could derive this element tungsten from. And the, uh, the uh, name wolfram was used for the chemical symbol, the atomic symbol W, that we use for tungsten. This is always one that stands out on the periodic table. Why is this W if it's called tungsten? Well, that is ultimately the reason. Let's talk about all of the elements that are named for a place. These are all pretty obscure elements. They are not everyday elements, so we're just kind, kind of going to go through them on the list here. Uh, the first one is rhenium, which is from Rhenus, which is Latin for the Rhine River. This, this was discovered near the Rhine River in Germany and named after that. Polonium is from Polonia, which is the Latin word for Poland, because it was discovered by Pierre and Marie Curie. Marie Curie was from Poland, and so she named it after her native land. Francium is named after France, because it was discovered by a French person. Americium, we are now getting into some of the later elements that have only been discovered uh, less than 100 years ago, really in the World War II and post-World War II era. Uh, Americium, as you can probably tell, is from America. It was discovered in America, not surprisingly, but this name was not random because it is directly under the element europium, which we talked about last episode, on the periodic table. And so they decided that if Europe gets an element, America should get an element too, and they are both connected because they are 
right uh, under slash over each other on the periodic table. Something similar happened with element uh, number 97, Berkelium, which is named after Berkeley, uh, which is a city in California in the Bay Area where a lot of this research, this atomic nuclear research was going on. Uh, this was also analogical to the element that was directly above it on the periodic table because the element above it was terbium, which was named after a village in Sweden. If you watched the last episode, you remember that there are actually four elements that were ultimately named after this same village in Sweden. So they figured, well, if this village in Sweden gets an element, then this town in California gets an element. And again, they are connected because they are uh, vertically adjacent to each other on the periodic table. Californium, obviously, just comes from California, so you can see that uh, all three of these are really named after the same place, but different degrees of the same place, depending on how far you zoom out. Dubnium is named from a town in Russia, Dubna, where a lot of research has gone on. It is uh, pretty close to Moscow. Uh, Hassium is named for Hassia, which is Latin for Hess, which is a region of Germany. And within that region of Germany is a town named Darmstadt. So Darmstadium is named after that town. And Hassium is named after the region of Germany in which that town is located. Nihonium is named for the Japanese word for Japan because some research uh, was done, being done in Japan and still is. And so it made sense that Japan would get a shout out in the element names as well. Muscovium is named for Muscovia, which is Latin for Moscow. It's the region of Moscow where the town of Dubna is located. So once again, there's kind of a doublet there between Dubnium or Dubnium and Muscovium because they're both ultimately named after the same place. Livermorium is named for Livermore, California, which is also in the Bay Area, not too far from Berkeley. It's the place where a lot of this research has been happening. So that's also connected to Berkelium and Californium and Americium, ultimately. Uh, and finally, Tennessine, which is one of the last elements to have been named at the point of this recording when I am saying these words, is named after the state of Tennessee in the United States because a lot of atomic research has been done in the state of Tennessee at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And some of it has also occurred at Vanderbilt University over in Nashville, which is a few hours west of Oak Ridge National Laboratory, but still in the state of Tennessee. So as you can see, lots of elements there named for some place, some city, some state, some region, some country, sometimes a continent. There is a lot of variety here. Uh, let's talk about another set of elements, elements that are ultimately named for some kind of mythological figure, even if the path to naming them after a mythological figure might have been a little bit winding. So we're going to start with Mercury. Obviously, everybody knows about the element Mercury, and you probably also know that there is a god Mercury and also a planet Mercury. All three of these things are ultimately connected to each other. So ultimately, the name of the element Mercury comes from the Roman god Mercury, who is equivalent if you know your mythology, to Greek Hermes. So Mercury or Hermes, these are the, this is the messenger god, essentially. He's known for flying through the air. He's known for being swift. Uh, and this is why the planet got its name. Now, we've already had a couple of episodes on the connection between the planets and the gods, so I'll put a link up here if you want to check that out. So the planet Mercury got its name uh, from the god Mercury and was connected to the god Mercury, going all the way back to classical antiquity. Um, however, the element was named for the planet which was then named for the god. So the element wasn't directly named for the god. The interesting thing is that this is not the original name of the element Mercury. The original name of the element Mercury, again, going all the way back to classical antiquity, is hydrargyrum. I know that's hard to say, and maybe that's one of the reasons we don't call it that anymore. But hydrargyrum goes back to two Greek words, uh, hydra, which means water, as you probably know, and arguros, which means silver. So the Greek word actually just means water silver, watery silver, which is actually a pretty good name for this element when you look at it. It's like silver that's runny, right? It's got a liquid form to it. In English, our native English word for this was quicksilver. Silver, and sometimes mercury is still called quicksilver. The quick here means it's in motion, but it's also alive. So it's like living silver. That's our native English word. So you got hydrargyrum or the ancient Greek word uh, hydrargyros, uh, and then you got quicksilver. 
And then we came to ultimately call this Mercury. Now, why did we come to ultimately call this Mercury? Well, as it turns out, there were seven metals that were known to classical antiquity and on into the Middle Ages. And as we've talked about on those previous episodes, there were seven planets that were known to classical antiquity and on into the Middle Ages. So one metal was associated with one planet. In other words, each planet had a metal that was associated with it and vice versa. And it just so happened that this particular element was associated with the planet Mercury, and sometimes it was easier to just call it Mercury because that was the planet that was associated with it. Now, with the other six metals that this could have happened with, uh, we did not end up calling them by their particular planet name. So, for instance, uh, Mars is associated with iron, all right? We don't call iron Mars, but that would be the equivalent of what we're doing with the element Mercury. All right, let's go on to other elements that are uh, ultimate, whose names ultimately come from from uh, uh, some kind of mythological figure. Uranium comes from the Greek Uranos, which is the god of the sky. Uh, but just like with Mercury, the element name is not actually named for the mythological figure. It's named for the planet, which was ultimately named for the mythological figure. Uranium was actually discovered uh, surprisingly long ago in the late 1700s before we even really had a good grasp on what radioactivity was. Uh, and it was named for the planet Uranus because that planet had been recently discovered. Really, uh, as far as I know, no better reason than that. Uh, other elements that are named for a mythological figure, Iridium is named for the Greek goddess Iris. She is the goddess of the rainbow, so she's associated with a lot of bright scintillating colors, and this element is known for its bright uh, scintillating color. So there's actually a reason behind why this element got called Iridium. Uh, thorium, uh, as you can probably tell, is named after the Norse god Thor, whom, is, who, whom you probably know is the god of thunder. Now, technically, this element was named after a compound because the same person who discovered thorium, the element, also discovered the compound thorite literally four years before he realized he could, he could synthesize an element out of it. Uh, however, he named the compound after the god Thor, and so I'm putting this here, even though technically we could have put this in the list of elements that were named after a compound, but I chose not to because it was, again, less than five years between when the compound was discovered and when the element was synthesized out of it. So this was not some kind of well-known compound that had been around a while. Ultimately, the name comes from the god. Uh, Neptunium and Plutonium are the two elements on the periodic table after uranium, and so they actually just got their names because they were the two elements in the periodic table after uranium, because Neptune was the planet that was discovered after Uranus, and then Pluto was the planet, or at least what was once considered to be a planet, that was discovered after Neptune. So Neptunium comes from Neptune, uh, which was the planet that was named after the god Neptune, aka Poseidon, in Greek mythology, and Plutonium was named after the dwarf planet Pluto that was named for the god Pluto, a.k.a. Hades, in Greek mythology. But again, these elements are not named for any specific connection with these gods or any kind of mythological traits that they are said to have. Uh, let's talk about the elements that are named for some kind of connection with another element. Platinum is an element that I know you have heard of. Where does the name platinum come from? It was an element that was discovered within the past few hundred years, in the 16 and 1700s. Um, it was discovered as part of the process of silver mining and sometimes gold mining uh, in, in the uh, Spanish colonies of South America, which explains why the, na why the name of platinum comes from Spanish, because the Spanish uh, people who were over there who were doing the mining were the ones who ultimately discovered this element. Um, so it was originally called by the Spanish platina, which is a diminutive of the Spanish word plata, which is the regular word for silver in Spanish. Uh, and so really what this name, what the name of this element means is it's the element that is silver's little sibling. Now today, platinum is actually worth a lot more than silver on the open market. So this might seem like a strange name to call it from our perspective. But at the time, uh, they were looking for silver. They valued silver a lot more. They didn't realize yet that platinum was this rare metal that would come to have a lot of value. Uh, sometimes they would just throw it away as an impurity in the silver or the gold that they were actually looking for. But it kind of looks like silver, right? If you know what platinum looks like, it looks a lot more like silver than most other elements. So you can see why this element would have been called, uh, you know, uh, some kind of inferior version of silver, at least when it was first named. Now we know better, but the name has stuck. 
Two other elements that are named for a similarity to another element. Uh, radon uh, actually comes from radium, which is an element that we already looked at. Now remember, radium comes from the, Greek, uh, the Latin word for a ray because it's radioactive and it emits rays. But radon is a primary product of the radioactive decay of radium. So when radium breaks down, it breaks down into radon gas. And then radon gas is also radioactive and it breaks down from from there. So radon is radioactive, but it doesn't get its name from the fact that it's radioactive. I know this is a little bit complicated, but it gets its name from the fact that it's an it's a, it's a element that is part of the breakdown process of radium, which is a radioactive element, which is how that element got its name. By the way, there are other elements that also break down into radon. Radium is not the only one. Uh, and protactinium gets its name from the fact that it is uh, a primary product of actinium. So this is going the other direction from the relationship between radon and radium. So protactinium breaks down into actinium, which is why it got the name protactinium, because that prot part comes from the Greek word proto, which we use sometimes, so you're probably familiar with it. It means first. So if you have actinium, it's likely that at one point it was protactinium, and then it broke down into actinium. So basically, they had no better name for this element than to say it's the earlier form of actinium, which they had already named at this point. So they named protactinium based on its relationship to actinium, which, as we have learned, is a radioactive element based on the etymology of its name. Uh, let's talk about all of the elements that are named for a person. Again, these are all elements that have been named recently because this did not used to be done to, 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 to happen, right? This is something that has been a pretty recent convention after World War II when we have been synthesizing and discovering all of these elements that are not really occurring in nature. Uh, the first one that was named for a person was Curium, named after the uh, famous team of Marie and Pierre Curie. Um, this element was also a analogical to gadolinium. Ultimately, you could argue that gadolinium is named after a person because ultimately it is, although it was kind of accidental that it came to be named after a person. In other words, you couldn't have necessarily seen those steps happening ahead of time. Well, as it turns out, curium is directly under gadolinium on the periodic table. So it made sense to those, to, to the people who were naming it, the scientists who were naming it. Again, this was happening shortly after World War II when they were discovering a bunch of new elements. It made sense to them that there should be an analogy between the element above it, which was gadolinium, and this element that they were just trying to name. And so they said, we should name this element after a person. And they decided that the Curies were the best people to name it after because of their notable contributions to the study of elements and radioactivity and everything else that they are famous for. So that's how the very first element was intentionally named after a person, or in this case, a couple. Uh, however, this would uh, continue with Einsteinium, obviously named after Albert Einstein, very famous. Fermium, named after Enrico Fermi, pretty famous. Mendelevium or Mendelevium, named after Dmitry Mendeleev, who was the one who really first put together the periodic table. Uh, Nobelium, named after Alfred Nobel. And then we get into some other people whom you may or may not have heard of. So you get Lorentzium, Rutherfordium, Seaborgium, Borium, Minarium, Rentgenium, Copernicium, named after Nicholas Copernicus, who lived hundreds of years before any of this was happening, but famous scientist, so they figured that he was fair game to get an element named after. Uh, fluorovium, agonessin, okay, and agonessin is actually the final element on the periodic table at this time, named after a Russian scientist. Actually, the last two there are both named after Russian scientists who have been doing a lot of work on discovering new elements. Uh, if you don't recognize a lot of these names here toward the end, uh, suffice it to say that most of the ones you don't recognize are engaged or were engaged uh, in the study of the periodic table and radioactivity and discovering new elements, which is why they have been honored in this way. Finally, we have one element left to look at before we complete the entire periodic table, and that element is lead. If you remember where we're going, this is the one element that does not have a clear etymology because this word has been in use for so long that its etymology has been lost to history. Now, sometimes words can be in use for a long time, like gold, and we are able to uh, trace them back to a well-known Indo-European root, but that is not the case with lead. We do know that the word lead goes back to the English word lead, which is... Uh, 
obviously pretty similar, hasn't changed much in the past 1500 years, and that goes back to a Proto-Germanic term, lauda, but we're not really sure how to trace it back past that. This is a word that is in many Germanic languages, but doesn't seem to uh, come from a clear Indo-European root. So we're not really sure where this name came from. Unlike with gold, where we can tell that it was named after a property, its yellowness, its shininess, or whatever. How about the, uh, the symbol? The symbol PB obviously looks nothing like lead uh, in the Germanic languages. Where does that come from? It comes from the Latin word for lead, which again, didn't look anything like our word for lead. That word was plumbum. So if you were an ancient Roman, you would call lead plumbum. And obviously we get a number of words like plumber. A plumber is someone who works with pipes. And it used to be that pipes were made out of lead. Hopefully not so much anymore now that we know of some of the deleterious properties of lead. So that's it. That's all of the elements. We have now looked at all 118 elements on the periodic table. I think there's some really fascinating etymologies in here, and I'd be interested to hear what you think is the most fascinating or interesting or surprising etymology. See you next time.